Uh, welcome to our latest um, Exit of the Iran conversation in philosophy. And today we'll be talking about continental philosophy, which it seems has been quite popular in Iran for some time, even before the revolution and certainly after the revolution. And one of the questions we're going to try and get to grips with is what do we mean by continental philosophy? How far perhaps do we go back in that conception? and uh, consider the way in which it is practiced and intersected with other branches and uh, traditions of philosophy in Iran uh, today. Um, and for that, uh, we're very pleased to have as our guest, um, uh, Milad Udabai from uh, Princeton. He's a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellow at Princeton at the, let me get it right, uh, the Sharmin and Bijan Musavir Rahmani Center for Iranian and rather interestingly called Persian Gulf Studies. Um, and uh, previously he was at McGill and his dissertation, his um, doctorate was from uh, Berkeley in anthropology. And, uh, and his, his work actually has been spot kind of in, right in this particular area. So we're very much looking forward to talking um, to him. Um, the format will remain the same. Um, myself and my colleague, uh, Mohsen Fez Bakhsh in Tehran, will ask our guest a few questions back and forth, and then we'll open it up to others to ask uh, questions as well. So, um, Milad, welcome. And uh, let me start you off with the most obvious question, perhaps, is that um, how did you come to the study of um, continental philosophy in Iran? Well, thank you so much, Sajad and Mohsen, for having me as part of these conversations. I have been listening to them, uh, enjoying them, and learning from them. Uh, also, your other series, Islam After Colonialism, which I think actually in an interesting way intersects with this series. If you think about Iran, uh, 20th century Iran, as a space of uh, pol um, transformation, struggling with tradition, modernity, questions of politics, society, so maybe we can, in the spirit of thinking continental philosophy, thinking philosophy, history, and language together, maybe we will sort of approach, uh, contribute to both of these conversations today. In fact, um, in other series, um, while we started on South Asia, we will be moving on to other parts of, of the world. Um, in fact, we will have a talk, which is Iran and South Asia next, uh, next term with Manakia. But please, yeah, sorry for interrupting, David. No, no, no. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I am an anthropologist and I am the first person to contribute to your program who's not a philosopher. So uh, I very much hope that we will uh, conduct this as a conversation. But let me just, um, to answer your question, how I came to my research. I, uh, was, I, I was born and raised in Iran. I was born a couple of years after the revolution and uh, I remember the first sort of experiences that were not dominated by politics of revolution and war, which lasted during the 80s, uh, was the political reform movement and how, uh, in an interesting way, horizon of political and religious reform, it seemed like, or at least what, what on surface seemed like quite important religious and political conversations and reckonings with uh, the revolution, the creation of an Islamic Republic, they're all tied to uh, translation. The, the, um, Muhammad Khatami, the president then, was trained in the seminaries, but also I remember importantly in Islamic, in, in Western philosophy, or at least that, that was important. That was an important social fact at that moment. Uh, new terms started circulating in um, in, in, in Iranian public sphere, including public sphere as a term, civil society. We all learned about hermeneutics through uh, in, 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 in pages that were called andishe in new newspapers. And we all followed Western thinkers and a continental philosopher and, and um, thought that there they had something to contribute to the immediate political situation after the revolution. Now, I left Iran in 2001 and I, uh, to, to the US, I studied engineering and I worked a couple of years as, as an engineer. And I know you had a whole conversation about this engineering uh, 
um, uh, turn to engineers turn to philosophy, which I think is quite interesting. And maybe we can return to this at a later uh, later uh, point. Um, it probably has to do with politics of war and reconstruction, so then the Yi and and the context where certain things and certain futures were thinkable and others like philosophy were not really thinkable for, for large sections of society. Um, but anyways, uh, the, I, during these years, uh, there were, I would, I kind of think of them as becoming defamiliarized with the context of Iran and with the sort of reified political divisions of Islamic, leftist, secular, um, people who are in, in Iran, people who are in the diaspora, and, and thinking about the sort of discursive historical world that encompasses people who seem to occupy really polarized positions. And think about what is shared in this history and that, that and, and what is, what, what in a way, what is uh, th this sort of background, the epistem uh, what are the epistemological resources, what are the historical forces and processes that encompasses people of apparently very different uh, political and religious orientations. And it is then that I started studying political theory and then anthropology. And um, like many uh, others, I was struck by the fact of proliferation of translation, which was even much more than the 90s, um, than the early uh, period of the reform movement. And, and as, as, a, as a practice that uh, cuts across various political, um, religious um, divisions and, and try to think about this anthropologically, thinking about what kinds of questions, what kinds of ethos, what kinds of pathos is brought to the practice of translation. Why, why, has, it, why has it become quite important in, in the 90s and 2000s? And, um, and yeah, so that, that became a project on translation for me. Um, cool, uh, that, that's very useful because it's always important to get a sense of, of who one's talking to uh, and where you're coming from. Um, Mohsen, do you want to start the kind of the main questions or do you want me to? Okay. Yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you, Mila, you, you talked about uh, the sphere of translation in, in, in continental philosophy in Iran. Um, I'm, uh, I, wa I want to start with uh, doing continental philosophy in universities. Uh, in our discussion of philosophy of religion last week, we talked about how, how the based in institutions engage with the field. Um, I think it is also the case that continental philosophy is pursued for a large part outside universities, outside, uh, in a sense, philosophy departments in universities. And uh, it, it happens in two levels. On one level, it is pursued uh, not only in philosophy departments, as you mentioned, uh, but also uh, in, in departments of social sciences, anthropology, and, and so on. Um, uh, besides, in contrast to analytic philosophy, I think much of continental philosophy is done outside universities. Uh, there are many private institutions uh, which hold courses and also uh, many publishers with, which publish translations of uh, major works in continental philosophy. Does this uh, have consequences for the way continental philosophy is pursued in Iran? Absolutely. I think that is a very important question. That is something I came to think about and thematize. So what happens when uh, the institutional um, settings uh, that the the um, traditions of inquiry that sustain these so that are that are cultivated within institutions like Hosa or like the universities are absent, and what kinds of consequences it has in, in on on production of knowledge on on philosophy. Um, I, if I can backtrack to answer the question, I think that. Um, uh, it is also in the US, for example, lots of continental philosophy happened outside of philosophy departments. So for example, at Berkeley, when I, where I did my graduate degree, most of continental philosophy happens in departments of comparative literature, literature, rhetoric, uh, and not necessarily in the philosophy departments, which is more analytic um, oriented. Um, 
in, in Iran, I, 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 part of my field work was to participate in these institutions that you are referring to. So for example, let's just name, to name a few, Corsesh Institute in Tehran has been quite important site of, of proliferation of, of, of continental philosophy. Translators, uh, thinkers like um, uh, Morad Farhad Pur, Javad Tablo Tabloi, others, uh, offer classes, have, off, have offered classes during various periods. Some still continue teaching there, some don't. And, 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 and it is from these centers outside of uh, the universities and outside of uh, Hoza's that continental philosophy gets into those spaces of knowledge production. And of course, this has to do with, in part, regulations, and it has to do with cultural revolution, which has been both restrictive and productive of Iranian post-revolutionary engagement with continental philosophy. But uh, in terms of consequences, I, 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 I feel like accumulation of knowledge, transmission of knowledge, uh, cultivation of debate, these are things that uh, are, uh, we know quite well in relationship to Hosa tradition of inquiry, how, how a shared set of debates, set of maybe texts, and um, uh, are, are central to the project of uh, philosophy, knowledge, um, and, and the absence of those is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a huge weakness for cultivation of um, continental philosophy um, in Iran. Uh, of course, uh, the absence of uh, institutional spaces is also one reason that people turn to philosophy to think about loss of these spaces. Why is it that universities are, are, are no longer thriving intellectual spaces for cultivation of philosophy? philosophy? Or why, 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 is, why isn't Jose the space where these kinds of questions could be asked? So, so this, what, what we are identifying as a, perhaps a weakness for continental philosophy is a reason that, that um, there is a strong investment in continental philosophy in Iran as well. And maybe I can kind of uh, follow that up by asking you, in a sense, you know, what, what do we really mean by continental philosophy? Because this is one of the classic questions. Um, now, I remember from uh, things I saw when I was a grad student in the 90s, and also I spent the early 2000s buying lots of translations. Um, but I was mainly interested at that time in uh, translations of um, Wittgenstein, um, Kant, and Hegel, you know, sort of the classic works. Um, and and of course, obviously, Hegel is very much an important figure in what then becomes conceived of as, as a continental tradition. But it seemed also to me that uh, perhaps the, the really big kind of domineering figure was the figure of Heidegger. Um, and we, we know that there are certain political and kind of social reasons why that happened. But um, do you think a continental philosophy has, has developed since then? So uh, are people very aware of the kind of the breadth of it? Um, do they look at continental philosophy in this historical sense is something which goes back to much earlier German thought? Um, or is it very much kind of about engaging with certain figures, um, you know, the, the more sort of modern, I guess, post Second World War figures um, who are well known? Um, for example, in, in literature departments, as you said, I think it's also true in, in Iran, a lot of the early study was in literature departments, or for example, figures like Foucault. Um, so maybe if you could say a bit more about kind of unpacking this category of continental philosophy. Um, I think um, I think that um, much what we are talking about, sort of the arrivals of continental philosophy in Iran through Heidegger, through the figure of Ahmad Fardid and the the intellectuals who were immediately around him and the sort of entanglement of that with the project of the revolution and cultural revolution uh, has been really unpacked in the post-revolutionary period. Uh, so um, since I'm an anthropologist, I'm gonna start with sort of these story. I, I have uh, done a lot of 
I've learned quite a bit from Jabot Tabotabai, for example, who was one of the, who sat in those classes, in Heidegger's classes, at, uh, Heidegger's, in fact, these classes in, in Tehran University when he was a law student. And, and so he, he has various, um, narrates a lot of, um, he had taken classes that were supposed to be classes, for example, on Hegel, but ended up being Fadid's commentary on, on, on Heidegger. The way he sort of compares this with his tra training with Islamic philosophy is that there was actually no text of Heidegger which was being debated or was the center of conversation. So there were a series of commentary. So, so when we say Heidegger, I'm not really actually sure how much Heidegger there was um, because there was not really a text or a debate on Heidegger. So that has changed, obviously, in the post-revolutionary context. There are many, many translations. There are also uh, sort of identifying the weakness of uh, continental philosophy prior to the revolution. So for example, Heidegger, uh, introduction of Heidegger to, to Iranian uh, debates. Um, uh, there's also a debate on philosophy that, that sort of, um, that is quite, I think, um, promising, quite important, that, that says that these episodic translations of European philosophy uh, are, 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 are episodic. They're not, they do not, they do not lead into cultivation of a tradition or a conversation with European philosophy. So what is needed is, is a kind of a, uh, a, a, a large project of, if you will, translation to recognize the various continuities of, and breaks from the ancients to the moderns. Uh, to, to, so this is, for example, one of Tabo Tabo's sort of projects to think about the significance of the, uh, of the, um, the, the Christian theology for transmission of, of Greek philosophy to the Renaissance to the later period. And of course, this is also a, not, ju not just simply a European story. There is quite a bit of, and you know this more than I do, contribution of Islamic philosophers to these debates of tr that, that, that culminate in uh, later philosophical traditions that then become part of the identity of Europe or are claimed as such anyways. Um, and, and to recognize, to enter a philosophical conversation, uh, some, something, some ejtihad uh, needs to be achieved vis-a-vis -vis the development of philosophy in Europe, that continental philosophy is only a later moment of, and only then there could be a, a dialogue with uh, philosophy, with continental philosophy that takes place in Iran. Right. Um, Mohsen, do you have a follow-up or, or shall I continue? Um, yeah. I was wondering if, um, if, if this, this translation stuff, if, if, uh, if this, this phenomenon that translation is, uh, is everywhere in continental philosophies in Iran, how, how this uh, relates to the, to the way that continental philosophy is Iran is related to uh, what is going on abroad. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in terms of, for example, in terms of analytic philosophy, uh, there are, uh, my, my impression is there are uh, more contributions to the, to the global problems of analytic philosophy, but uh, this may not be the case in continental philosophy. Uh, do you think if, if this is a case, or if so, it, is it because of the uh, proliferation of translation uh, and how how would be the future of uh, these kind of relations between continental philosophy uh, as it is doing as it is done in Iran and abroad? Um, just to make sure that I get the question, is the question that there is more contributions to analytic philosophy from Iran to to mm -hmm. let's say a more to Anglophone or Euro American? Uh, production of analytic philosophy than in continental philosophy. In comparison to continental philosophy, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't really know about the comparison, but you're right that there are not many books that get translated from Persian to English on continental philosophy. There is some very recent efforts, and, and there are some uh, trans some, some some figures of translation that were 
uh, important in introducing continental philosophy in the last 20 years in Iran. Uh, some young scholars who then immigrated to Europe or the US and they are uh, now, um, they, they, they continued their education and they are now also introducing some of the Iranian debates, some of the Iranian contributions to uh, Anglophone audience. Uh, but but you're right to identify that um, that 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 there is uh, not much contribution that much and I think that 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 is that is um, part of it is has to do with what the, the European expectations your American expectations of continental philosophy um, and where it comes from is probably and some of it is that the problems of that are being addressed. Uh, by continental philosophy uh, to, in Iran uh, are unique problems and it takes a lot intellectually to translate those problems that thinkers and translators are trying to address um, back into Anglophone um, or Euro-American debates of um, continental philosophy. Um, so I think some of the work that um, might, uh, I think that I have tried to, to, to try to show how continental philosophy, once it goes to the Iranian world, becomes defamiliarized, defamiliarized and it's no longer sort of European thinking and it becomes something else and how that could be then rendered back into thought, how, how can, can that be thought as a, as a new and independent type of problem. Uh, I think we also should really note there is also a global market, um, and there is the, the 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 there is a circulations of text into including philosophy in our contemporary world are also part of the global circulation of goods and and images and the lore of goods and images and there is something about continental philosophy that uh, also captures the imaginations of people globally and is. Uh, you know, gets absorbed into the capitalist economy and it's not independent of it. I mean, if I, if I link back to um, the conversation we're having with um, uh, Mohammed Saidi Mehr on, on a philosophy of religion, it seems that um, the vast majority of philosophy of religion going on in Iran is basically what you would describe as analytic or um, Anglo-American, basically, um, in most cases coming from a Protestant kind of background anyway. Um, and, and part of this, it's, I think perhaps there's an element of uh, the analytic tradition is being um, privileged because there's almost kind of this apologetic sense of, of keeping up, right? Of, of using a language which is a, a privileged language to talk about these sorts of issues, which is the analytic tradition. And alongside that, maybe there's a sense in which the continental kind of idiom is somehow damaged because of the reception of Heidegger um, before and after the revolution. So is, is there something in that perhaps that, um, that continental philosophy, because it has a particular kind of um, um, trajectory from earlier periods, which is very much associated with Faradid, and not everyone likes Faradid um, for all sorts of reasons. And and Heidegger um, is, um, you know, this kind of sense of the, the mystification of, of thought, especially when, as you mentioned, in most cases in the early period, they didn't have text to deal with. So the question of precision does not arise. Um, maybe there's a sense in which the uh, content of philosophy, certainly in more philosophical circles, was kind of marginalized precisely because of this, this sort of dual point. Uh, I think, uh, certainly, I think the introduction had an effect uh, on, on, on the subsequent developments. But, you know, to be honest, I have, when I, so inhabiting these spaces, these institutions, from Forsage to elsewhere, uh, going to some of the research centers uh, of seminaries in Rome, uh, talking to uh, scholars at various institutions in Rome, including Danishkahe, Adyon Ba Mazahid, religions and denominations, um, uh, talking to folks that had 
thought at or did research in Imam Khomeini Research Institute and going to various various universities in Tehran. So both post-revolutionary universities like Harriet Modares, but also universities that had a, have a few were established prior to the revolution and engaging with folks who were um, who were sort of who who came um, to occupy and uh, these these institutions and conduct research and teach after the revolution. So folks who had some of them had both Jose and university educations. Actually, I particularly were interested to 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 speak with those because they 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 were trying to bridge uh, distinct uh, traditions of inquiry and. The, there, they, there. I did not think that their uptake of uh, continental philosophy was affected by these earlier Heideggerian debates. They were, they were. That, that did. I don't think that came into uh, inform their practice either negatively or positively. They were not necessarily situating themselves in a that tradition. So, like. No, and Dishanadini, for example, they don't particularly situate themselves. Oh, you and I can 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 do some work to situate them in this history and what that you know what that means for their thinking, the the sort of uh, the horizon of their thinking, their limitations of their thinking. Uh, but but in, as it's as they're conducting research or teaching, they're not quite affected uh, by their um, by this politicized conversation. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but. No, no, I, mean, I, I think that that's, that's quite interesting. Um, that there are, I mean, maybe philosophy of religion is, is, is a bad example um, because, you know, continental philosophy of religion is not popular in many places. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's very much seen as a bit of a niche. Um, even in, in, in American academia, it, it's very much a niche associated with certain individuals and certain departments. Uh, and for example, in Britain, it's, it's, it's basically absent completely. Um, you won't find continental um, uh, philosophy of religion in, in British universities, um, certainly. In Irish universities, it's different, but certainly not in British ones. So I, maybe that's a, a, a bad example, but um, I guess then the question is, if, if you have these sort of um, you know, what uh, rather lazily one might call hybrid individuals, you know, people who have this kind of mixed background. Um, so why, why do you think they're interested in, in continental philosophy? Um, I think there are, um, I think something that came out, I, if uh, I am curious what you think about this as well, uh, in, in all three previous conversation, um, so in the first conversation was about Islamic philosophy and sort of implications of Islamic revolution on their receptions and understanding of Islamic philosophy broadly defined and its subsequent developments. And in the conversation on philosophy of science and philosophy of religion, I think your questions and your speakers both um, talked about the kind of political context in which these fields were, were, were established. So they, they talked about the religious reformist sort of debates of the 80s as then leading to the establishment of fields like political, um, like, like um, re religious philosophy, philosophy of religion. Uh, and then you, you also similarly in relationship to um, philosophy of science, I think your, your speaker talked about how the students and scholars come to um, to, to face certain social questions, certain questions about the self, about society, about politics, and then are, they need answers. They, they, are, they, they turn to philosophy and they have created a space now under the rubric of philosophy of science to answer questions that uh, are pressing and people uh, are, feel and are compelled to answer and pursue answers. Uh, and I, I think similarly, uh, continental philosophy is a site where, where, where questions that are deeply rooted in, in the history of um, 20th century Iran, modern Iran, if you will, questions of how to make sense of the social, how to construct the social, participate in understanding and, and questions of 
you, these are the questions that also motivate. Um, uh, you could argue that this is also the question that motivates the cultural revolution and the Islamic revolution in general, that, that certain modes of tradition were no longer accessible and the revolution was the expression of that and the project of a modern uh, Iran that also inherits the Islamic tradition um, is now pursued through uh, an engagement with uh, in philosophical engagements with continental and other forms of philosophy. So I think there are there are certain questions that have arisen within the seminaries within traditional spaces of knowledge production that that require answers and uh, that that are not answerable within those specific discourses and translation comes to be a site where um, new questions and new answers emerge i mean in some ways it relates to this um uh, i mean we were talking about this right at the beginning which is uh with, with saya this this whole question of um you know where is the interaction um should Islamic philosophy be in conversation with analytic or with continental philosophy? And of course, we know there are very strong views on both sides. So you have the old, you know, Corbin Nasser school, which is all, which is all about, you no, know, the, the site of engagement is continental um, because analytic philosophy is a, because it's based on a kind of a caricature of what continent analytic philosophy is. And on the other hand, you've got people who say, no, it can only be with analytic philosophy because analytic philosophy is the only game in town, right? Uh, it's the only thing which provides rigor, um, I, you know. And on that, I'm, I'm minded of, uh, reminded of this famous kind of observation that um, Jack Caputo, who, whose work I really like and who I think is a wonderful continental philosopher, stroke theologian, who said that one of the problems with this idea of rigor is that it's always associated with this notion of precision of language, but rigor can also mean the success of some sort of explanatory force and power and what often happens in continental philosophy it, which has a you know usually the idea is has a better literary style is that it has better explanatory power it might not be precise in the kind of propositional way that analytic philosophers like but it actually is more successful um, and it seems that maybe that's something which some thinkers would, I mean, it, it depends. I, I, I can see Mohsen maybe smiling. I don't know which side of the fence he is. And I, I tend to be a bit more on the continental than the analytic, uh, but maybe I just don't like um, precision because I think precision has its own problems, at least within the, another thing that we did talk about a lot in the first uh, session was the, the, the various types of, um, colonial privilege which arise out of Euro-American modes of, of reasoning, of argumentation, of idiom. Perhaps Mohsen wants to... Uh, uh, no, I'm, to be short, um, maybe we should, I, I, I don't want to defend something, uh, but, uh, but, but maybe um, I think to be short uh, and, and avoiding being too long, maybe we, sh we should probably uh, turn to the uh, audience if they have any other questions or if they would like to pursue the debate. Can I ask a question? Um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. I was just thinking, um, we, we said, because we haven't actually been going for that long, we started a bit later. Um, shall, shall we focus really on what Milad's uh, research is and, and say a bit, ask him a bit more about the translations? Right, and then and then Majid has a question. Maybe others will have questions. Yeah. So okay. um, so yes, uh, Milad, if you could tell us a bit more of that, about this process of translation that you've been working on, and and how that is intersecting with um, the continental tradition. Sure. Um, as I said, I, I think I laid out the kind of sites of my research, but and and I gave some kind of a historical account of how I came and how I some of my questions were also the questions that I tried to study about what, you know, what, 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 what passions, what questions, what urgencies are brought to practices of reading and translation of European uh, continental or European thought in general. I think that the, the division from point of my view of my research, um, I am 
I understand the distinction of analytic and, and, and continental philosophy. I certainly understand it in the context of Iran and what uh, the, the genealogies of those, those two and what they stand for. But within the spaces that, um, um, that, I, that I talked about, I did not necessarily think a sharp division was, uh, was, was drawn. Um, but these, I understand that these are already hybrid spaces, as you call them, uh, and and you, you would find uh, spaces that are more exclusive and more partial to 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 these. But they also, my my question, my anthropological question of my research is, what happens when a conceptual const constellation moves across uh, distinct borders of cultures, histories, discursive arrangements, and and what happens to them? How how, how do they come to embody? Um, uh, other questions, other formations, other uh, participate in formations and decomposition and deconfigurations of other histories and, and, and certainly uh, and become something entirely different. Um, and, and how um, in the case of Iran, translation is sort of everywhere. You have, you, you, you know, they, they are part of the debates of politicians and statesmen and, and 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 what where does this come from? And uh, the kind of the, the 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 circulations of ethos of let's say seminaries that that come to be um, uh, decimated in non 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 seminary spaces um, in government in um, in universities uh, and the consequences of that, but also weaknesses of that that we sort of talked about the the lack of institutional. Uh, textual um, sort of systematic um, accumulation of knowledge and transmission of, of, of knowledge. Um, I have also tried to situate this uh, moment of continental philosophy in a longer history of uh, Iranian engagement in with European thinking that you know one goes back to the 19th century and emergence of Roshan Fekri like enlightened, enlightened thinking the new a new genre of thinker that did not come from uh, institutions of the Hosa or the Iranian court in the 19th century. And they were um, they in reference to forms of European thinking and certain European discourses offered a social critique and political critique. Um, and then how this trend of thought was inflicted uh, and caught in the 20th century political struggles of Iran. So you have debates of um, anti-imperialism, post-colonial, uh, post-colonially inflicted refashioning of uh, Islam, as Shariati would say, from to an ideology, uh, from tradition to ideology, um, and and which is this, you know, very much inflicted by translating certain European trends of certain continental trends of thought, and and uh, but it it then politicizes tradition. Islam as a uh, in this uh, sort of uh, against what was described by Fadi and later Shai, uh, Al Ahmad uh, against the best toxification of Iran and how that then creates the conditions of the cultural revolution how how the the project of folding in together seminaries and universities and producing Islamic social sciences and Islamic human sciences comes to embody these trends. So on the one hand, it relies on the confidence that um, there is such a thing as Islamic social sciences and Islamic human sciences that is in the parallel field to what is understood to be uh, secular or European social sciences. And in this, and, and what are what are the sort of politics of knowledge being territorialized in this sense? And this is, I suppose, where. Islam after colonialism debates are interesting to me. How how, how certain uh, formations of thought, assumption, categories come to be internalized, even if they are when they are posed uh, against colonialism and how they're reproduced. And we see that when you, I think you you were kind of implicitly pointing to that out when you were talking about philosophy of religion being modeled after certain um, certain. Uh, Protestant uh, formations. It is interesting that Islamic philosophy of uh, religion then becomes to be the. You know, what is the what um, untrans? What how is untrans? What are the consequences of elision of untranslatability and incommensurability in production of knowledge in making 
you know, to in producing, in adding an Islamic adjective to, 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 um, to various things from, you know, uh, from philosophy to feminism to human rights to, and 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 thinking. So this is now the conceptual one of the conceptual um, questions that my work asks is what the the social world that is predicated upon this kind of elision, which is not really, which is not only a question of post-colonial historiography. It's a it's a question that we could we could draw on the gene, various colonial genealogies of categories of knowledge, which is quite important to do and understand. But it's about the construction of a world and 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 a, a lived experience um, that that um, post revolutionary uh, engagement with translation is a is a way to get to. Cool. So, I mean, we'll have more on this, but let's let's go now to, to Majid because Majid has a question and I don't want to, but we'll open it up, but we'll continue the conversation. Majid, do you want to ask a question? Hello. Where's he gone? <laughs> okay, well, we can come back to Majid. Is some, does someone else have a question they would like to ask? If if uh, nobody has a question, I can have, ask a question for maybe Mohsen. Mohsen, I, you you have um, you you yourself have have done work uh, drawn on various philosophical debates, European and not, to think about. You, I was I was looking at your writing on the par like on on Tom Spoon and paradigm and other things. I, how what is how would you ex explain your own experience of drawing on? European philosophy to thinking about sort of questions of tradition, knowledge. Um, I, uh, uh, a kind of tough question <laughs> because uh, I'm not very much engaged with uh, European philosophy in, the, in terms of the continental philosophy. And as working extensively, I have been working extensively on, on uh, philosophy of religion in its specific sense. Um, but I think, um, I, let me tell you this, I, I think that there have been some works on, uh, on, 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 the, on the meaning and, and the use of comparative philosophy, what has been termed comparative philosophy. Um, uh, maybe so, some, someone like uh, Robert Neville and, and so on. Uh, have done works on the way we can compare different philosophical traditions, and especially they they have uh, they they have extracted some methodological insights from the way uh, Chinese philosophy and Confucian uh, traditions uh, have been in conversation with the European uh, and North American thinking. Uh, I think those uh, insights may be useful, normatively speaking, in, in the way we can uh, we can be in contact. We, as Iranian uh, philosophers or Iranian uh, uh, staff who works on, on philosophy stuff, um, in help helps in in the in the way in, in, in have insights in the way uh, we can uh, contribute or we can uh, have we can be in conversation with. Uh, with the works uh, of European philosophers in either continental tradition or uh, or um, analytic tradition or any 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 other any other any any other tradition. Thank you. Okay. Um, so is Majid there? He's not there. Okay. Oh, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi, Mila. I really Hi. enjoyed. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. I was just wondering about the to what extent the mechanism of translation is important for you. I mean, in your project, the way materials are translated into Persian, and to what extent they can, you know contribute to Iranians' knowledge of continental philosophy. I'm asking this because the story is different to some extent in Islamic studies. What is produced in the West 
are to some extent treated selectively when they're going to translate it into Persian. It depends on the context. I, I'm just wondering to what extent, for example, the works of Nietzsche, Kant, I don't know. So to what extent they are faithfully translated or they are censored. I don't know if we can use the term censor. I mean, it depends on the context. So that was my question and well done with your project. Thank you. Um, I, I, my sense is that if you're speaking uh, about like actually official censorship of text, my sense is that most theoretical texts are translated and censorship is not ex a, a major issue um, in terms of um, simply introducing a European thinker. Um, um, but, but I might also be wrong because I actually, so I should step back and say, I didn't exactly work on censorship. So I, I, I have little knowledge of that, but my sense is that just because they are not directly pushing against the uh, if you will, uh, a certain kind of official um, uh, um, let's say synthesis of religion and politics in Iran. Uh, Nietzsche is not directly countering that or it, 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 there is no issue in translating Nietzsche. Although of course if you were going to develop the implications of someone's like Nietzsche's work or Frankfurt School or whoever else, of course these might be um, um, kind of pushing against Karo Atarasmi, but not, not directly. And I think this is also points to the way that activism and translation are become sort of become one because that's an area where you can actually say things and do things uh, without uh, coming to contact with censorship, with restrictions imposed on, um, on, on various uh, forms of expression after a revolution. Um, but but it does seem the the actual process of translation is seems important, right? When we are th thinking about conceptual configurations, because yeah. it's not about simply about words that get translated, but about the the the, the status of concepts with, within a conceptual configurations. And unless that conceptual configuration is rendered, um, uh, not necessarily. This is, I guess, this is where I personally have a little bit of a hard time with um, translation as always defamiliarizing, which is the accounts of translation which we get from uh, literary studies from um, that, that are not so much invested in thinking about conceptual configurations, but they're about uh, the, the debate about how do you when the, the familiarization, defamiliarization within translation. Uh, so it seems that they are important, and I think that they are. Uh, this is something that is hotly also debated in, uh, in, in among translators and among critics of translators in Iran, in, in contemporary Iran. So I, for example, remember hot debates when Schmidt's political theology was translated. There were there were a bunch of like you know there, there were translators who were criticizing uh, the choices that the translators have had made and missing. The, the conceptual intervention of Schmidt by trying to simulate Schmidt's language to an accessible language in Persian, right? And I think that is something uh, to, to think about, about translations of philosophy or continental philosophy. Thank you very much. And another question, can I ask? Um, sure, go ahead. Uh, this, this is a general question. I asked Milad also, Sajjad as well as Mohsen. Can we say that do we have continental Islamic studies or continental theology? This is my question. What, what do you mean by that? Can you say a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you have a specific idea as well. What do we mean by continental philosophy? Can we, you know, relate this one to, I mean, we have some notions, I mean, understanding about what is, what do we mean by continental philosophy, right? So can we say that we have continental Islamic studies or continental theology? Um, uh, this is a general question. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, I I'm think what you could yes. possibly say is that there is, um, 
a continental mode of doing theology or philosophy of religion, which is mm. distinct from an analytic one. But whether you could extend that to Islamic studies, because Islamic studies is much more than just theology, right? So, um, um, and even within that context, I mean, analytic Islamic theology is, um, or, analytic, or Islamic analytic philosophy, I think is, for me, is a very problematic term uh, because of the way uh, some people have talked about it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. You know, um, I'd, I'd really be interested to know if there are people in Iran who are very much working, uh, you know, in the tradition of people like Jean-Luc Marion, um, Jack Caputo, um, uh, Richard Carney, um, etc. cetera, um, uh, in what they're doing. Um, or even if they're, they're people who are doing things which are, it's not quite continental, but some, you know, someone like Grace Jansen, who's a feminist, well, she was a feminist um, um, theologian. I'd be really interested to see if there was that sort of work in, in Persian or that sort of engagement in Persian, because I think that is quite radical. And that's, that's much more radical for a traditional view of theology and God in Islam than say even open theism and other forms of analytic theology, Christian theology are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mila. Thank you, Sergei. I don't know, Mila, do you know if these works have been translated or if, if there's much engagement with that? I, I don't know if these are translated, but that would be also interesting. And I think I, I, if I understand the question and your answer, I think I follow what, you, what your answer, that there could be a continental approach to these things, but, uh, whether continental um, Islamic studies or, or well, that, that it, there might be continental approaches in these fields, but also these fields are also, you know, modern fields of inquiry that their own establishment are responding to a certain situation that happens uh, intellectually in the 20th century in contemporary academy uh, that also have to do with the history of developments of study of non-West in, in Euro-American worlds. There's a question in the chat um, uh, oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. Let's go there. Yeah, um, yeah. Before you read the question, I just want to note that uh, th these kind of works are, are hardly been translated into Persian, uh, maybe because of the context of the translations of continental philosophies in Iran, which has uh, almost nothing to do with these theological stuff. They even uh, those who are uh, engaging with translating uh, continental stuff uh, in Persian, into Persian, uh, they they even uh, uh, don't know. Uh, they even don't uh, consider, for example, Jean Luc Marion as a continental uh, as a, a continental philosopher at all. And it, for example, Jean Luc Marion is is hardly known in in the Persian literature. Um, there there have been some little works mm -hmm. on based on the insights of uh, Merle Westphal or Caputo or uh, Jean-Luc Marion, but it is very scarce. I mean, I, I'd be interested to know if, if like Caputo's works on hermeneutics have been translated because I can imagine they would be at least... His work on, on religion, his work on religion has been translated on, on, on religion. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that makes any sense because the book on religion makes no sense to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> mainly because I think my own con it's because of my own conception of what religion is it doesn't make sense but um, it's, it's like his concept of, of theological atheism I, I really would be interested to know how that would be received in Persian um, because of course he doesn't mean atheism as a denial or an, em uh, an absence but he means this kind of affirmation of it right so um, you know, the famous quotation of, of Eckhart's of, um, oh, God save me from God, you know, that sort of stuff, which he describes as theological atheism. Um, but, but these are uh, just uh, just casual translations, uh, and, and there's no systematic work on these kinds of, uh, and, and these uh, problems uh, within the religion. Uh, maybe if we consider uh, continental philosophy in its broader sense, maybe those works which are um, which are which have been done under the influence of the uh, hermeneutics, 
for example, the, the works done by Muhammad Mushtaq Shabistari and so on, maybe this can be uh, introduced as some kind of continental theology or, or so. so. So I guess that brings us to um, the question in the chat. Uh, so <laughs> if you would, uh, um, yeah, have you question, looked at it? Question. Yeah chat about uh, significance of, significance of Mujtahar al-Shabistari as part of some sort of religious intellectuals who, who yeah. I think that the, actually the term Qaraat al-Rasmi that I kind of yeah. use now to think about it is his. It and is. Was, it was posed in, in relationship to hermeneutical approaches. And this is the moment where hermeneutics became uh, quite important uh, uh, in, in, for religious intellectuals, but also not just religious intellectuals, that was I was looking at um, an important essay that Murad Farhad, who is an important translator of continental philosophy, has. It's called, the, the essay is Tafakkur Tarjome, which sort of um, um, argues against the distinction and, and between thinking and, and translating. And, and, and he points out to the significance of role of language and history in translation, so sort of a continental, if you will, intervention. And also says when uh, him and a group of colleagues were thinking about um, what traditions to translate, what, what texts to translate, they decided on the hermeneutic tradition from Schleimacher to Diltai to Heidegger and Gadamer precisely because of this quality, the historical um, quality of their, uh, of their philosophizing and, and its attention to language. Um, so, um, I, so Mushtaq is absolutely an important figure, but, but, but um, whether, um, so my, my take is to, to recognize that also hermeneutic tradition has its own distinct genealogy from Christian history and, and, and to what extent is it possible to pick up um, without thinking of that history and that genealogy and, uh, as, and, and make it a political intervention uh, it's not. It's a movement that comes true from the outside, true translation, as opposed to. This is also the rift between, let's say, orthodox. If we can conceptualize something like orthodoxy versus position of religious intellectuals. I remember at, at the heyday of these debates in Iran, um, Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi, in a Friday prayer sermon, said that they they tell they used the word hermeneutic and said. They tell us we need to approach the Quran hermeneutically as if it was Divane Hafez. That was that was his phrase. Uh, so there, is, this schism is important to think about, and um, about also to think about the limitations of the um, this Noandi Shidini or this this uh, this form of uh, religious reform or so-called religious reform that that uh, draws on cer certain, we could, you could say, secular hermeneutic tradition uh, from, from the West as a way to intervene in Islamic development of uh, putting forth some, some idea of Islamic reform. Um, on Schmidt, the question is, you have worked on Schmidt. Uh, you, how much do you think his thoughts are applicable to what is going on in Iran? So I, I have tried to, um, I think I, I sat in classes on Schmidt, both within universities and outside, and I distinctly remember how a um, how a somebody who was teaching Schmidt said that what Schmidt describes seems to really be a, be be very very sovereign makes decisions. Uh, it seems very applicable to the Iranian situation. Uh, my own th my own thinking is um, that it is not so much to say whether a theory is applicable to certain social reality, but to, to think about how are uh, theories like Schmidt, who have, um, who have a historicity, emerge in a particular context, have a, have a whole genealogy behind them, are picked up as to, to interpret another social reality and think about the, the implications of that, the limitations of that, and the sort of social world that's constructed through this uh, kind of inter uh, this this kind of translation and uptake of Schmidt. Um, so that the question of whether Schmidt is applicable to Iran, I, I, I leave that uh, aside. I leave that open. Um, and I think that there's another response. Yeah. Um, I mean, on, on that, um, 
you know, um, with this category of political theology, I mean, political theology is suddenly becoming very trendy in all sorts of contexts. And there's a lot of, um, I, you know, I even have colleagues doing comparative Christian uh, Muslim <laughs> political theology. Um, and there's a book which has just come out on that. Um, is that a, a category that you find being engaged in in Iran at the moment? I mean, not just Schmidt himself, but kind of maybe the, the sort of the field that he's engendered. Um, is that a, is that a um, because a, the political theology is often used as a critique of the present, right? <laughs> it's a critique either of theology or it's a critique very much of the present. So um, you know, beyond maybe someone teaching it in a particular way, is this something that someone would publish? Um, you, you mean, I also am struck by, um, by the recent uptake. And in fact, like I, I started paying attention and, and writing a piece on translations of Schmidt as a way to, to, to critically reflect. I remember also in early in grad school, I was also drawn to Schmidt and trying to make sense of politics and reading about sovereignty and whatnot. Uh, and then pausing to recognize that, okay, this is this model of theory application it has its own limitations and whether political theology as a, as a category like religion as a, that, that's, that we know has distinct genealogies and comes to offer a kind of a pluralism while also maintaining a European sort of exceptionality and how is, it, is this uncritically picked up? I think I remember it being used um, in, in, in like writing on Iran, on new political theology of reform. Somehow it, it offered, um, and, 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 and I find myself in an academic situation, in a context where I'm invited, for example, to talk about Islamic political theology, while I'm not even sure if that, that term makes any sense, right? That there is an attempt to pluralize political theology coming from left post-colonial academics who then invites all, all others um, to, to intervene and pluralize the field of political theology. And it has emerged as a more pluralistic term, but uh, like you, I, I think I have some questions about whether that is, uh, to what extent that subjects us to a cunning of recognition of that term and the limitation it imposes in thinking about distinct genealogy of Islamic politics and distinct um, developments of uh, Islamic politics. And what is interesting is that in Iran, you actually have a history in which to track the developments of Islamic political thought uh, without subsuming it to a generic Euro-centered category of political theology that, that historically it resides in European debates. And I think that's partly also about this, this term sovereignty. I mean, I don't think one, def one doesn't necessarily have to look at Schmidt to discuss sovereignty, because of course, I would say that the term for sovereignty is, is Valayat, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there was a very extensive discussion on what Valayat means, you know, before the revolution, after the revolution, uh, in much more theological contexts, in political context. And so in a sense, one doesn't even need the term. And, and, and also, you know, the simple kind of, I guess, critique, which is maybe, um, you know, Syed would call this a slightly orientalist critique, but what, what is political theology in Persian? <laughs> you know, I mean, what is the term? Um, you'd have to kind of make one up because even though there have been these recent meetings in places like Lebanon and uh, the Arab, um, Christians and Arab Muslim thinkers couldn't agree on how you even translate political theology into Arabic. Um, because the, the concept doesn't really arise um, either in Christian Arabic thought or in, in Muslim Arabic thought. So, so you have to find different ways of doing it and simply translating it as something like Ilahi um, Siyaso um, or Siyaso I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's, it doesn't really tell you anything. You know, that translation in itself doesn't really tell you anything, anything because it's not a natural term. When you say it's a natural term, you mean that it doesn't devil, it doesn't emerge from sort of some matrix of tradition? And it well, it's, it's, it can emerge through a process of translation, of course, right? But what I'm saying is that, uh, the, I think the initial stage of someone saying, okay, 
using this term. And I guess it comes back to your question of familiarity and, and lack of familiarity, right? So if someone were to use that term, would the people listening to them immediately understand what they were saying? Would they say, oh, we're talking about Schmidt? Or would they say, no, no, we're talking about a wider phenomenon which goes back to the ancients and in the way in which a lot of more interesting creative work on sovereignty is being done now. There's uh, there have been at least two or three volumes which are looking at different contexts of sovereignty, not just European context, and thinking, can we even define sovereignty in, in a sort of a universal sense, which might be understandable in contexts, in non-European, non-Western contexts as well? Um, you know, where can a comparative study of sovereignty take us, right? Um, and that's, you know, going far beyond a, a, a narrow Schmittian. And, and even, I mean, Schmidt has, has other kinds of restrictions as well. It's not just this wide issue. It, it could, you know, it could be the case of, well, is it too much of an emphasis on sovereignty? What are other issues? What about the social sphere? What about the public sphere? What about questions of justice? What about compassion? What about companionship? What about friendship? Are these not all issues which really fall within the remit of what you would consider political theology? And yet many of those issues are not directly dealt with by Schmidt at all. I have to say that at the same moment that political theology, Elahiyat Siyasi, was translated as such and was emerging as a term and, and a rubric, whether there are news reports about Elahiyat Siyasi, there were, there were seminars in these same institutions and in there, Elahi, Schmidt was being read by um, academics and seminarians. Uh, I also attended a, a, a sat in part of a two year long course at Porsesh Institute, where Java Tabo Tabai started with uh, reading of Aristotelian ethics. And then the um, sort of the uptake of Aristotelian ethics in by Aquinas, uh, by St. Thomas, and, and sort of the emergence, so tracking the emergence, a particular emergence of. Uh, that, that category of political theology, and then sort of carrying it for, forward to, to theologians of school of um, Salamanca about the uh, emergence of natural rights. And um, so, so as, as a way of offering a way of thinking about political theology, that is the, uh, that was a critique of more, let's say, Roshan Fekri, intellectual translations of Schmidt to make sense of, uh, let's say, Velayat Fari in the Iranian context. Right. Um, it also sort of shows you sometimes how some of these things don't necessarily work. So I remember a long time ago examining a PhD um, in Britain, actually, and it was an Iranian um, student uh, working on natural um, natural law, and it was actually a dissertation on on Mullah Sadr on natural law, and who knew that Mullah Sadr has a theory of natural law? But anyway, um, so basically, what it was was an attempt to make uh, Mullah Sadr compatible with John Finnis, John Finnis's very particular Thomist taking on take on on um, uh, on natural law. And, and sometimes I, I think one gets a sense, certainly in, in some of the study of, of philosophy of religion in Iran, one gets a sense of this sort of um, rather straightforward kind of um, conflation is happening. Um, but um, I mean, what, you know, one doesn't necessarily have to be doing continental philosophy to make it compatible with some sort of Islamic way of looking at the world. One could just be doing continental philosophy because that's how you think you need to address the sort of questions that you have about you know, life, about writing, about language, about humanity, about the reality that you're living in. It doesn't necessarily have to be theologically motivated. Um, so let me ask you the question, where do you think some of the more creative kind of content of philosophy is happening in Iran? And uh, in what sense are they, which, which particular authors in the European tradition are they building on and, and how are they taking things beyond them? I think that's a hard question. Um, um, I think the interesting questions 
that I think at least uh, is to to how how continental philosophy is put into different tasks that it has been traditionally has been a part of. So if you understand philosophy, continental philosophy as having ar arisen historically to deal with a set of specific questions and has been part of the constitute that those form those questions and answers are part of the movements of sort of European history. How what is what would be some of the interesting work of translation is that how these th these debates, these texts, these concepts, these methodologies that have been developed uh, are are put into a different use and are rendered to ask a different question to elaborate it problem a problematic that they have not uh, they, they, they have not been a part of and uh, th that is what where the I think for me the interesting work of um, of, of continent translation of continental philosophy after revolution in Iran sort of uh, entails and I think it's uh, it's very much has to do with questions of um, sort of tradition, continuity, and ruptures into modes of transmissions of tradition, with epistemological, um, uh, epistemic limits of certain intellectual constellations, certain philosophical constellations, constellations of kalam, of uh, of uh, theology, of fair, and and how um, how those limits are reflected upon, both by um, but by by thinkers who inherit the agenda of the cultural revolution of how to 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 think at the intersection of modern formations of knowledge continental philosophy as one of as part of that and also traditional um let's say jose education and, and trying to think about the historical limits of this sort of this emergence of uh so so you you have Various thinkers who have tried to draw on um, archaeology and genealogy to think about the movements of uh, Islamic, let's say something like Islamic political thought. Uh, of course, they're thinking of it in in relationship to a particular moment of Islamic political after thought after the revolution. But to, to, uh, using these methods and putting it to to make a space. Uh, to reflect on the, the, the what appears as um, sort of a natural conflation of Islam and politics and to, to denaturalize that and to carve out a space outside of that and also critics of this trend so uh, that that to me is a is a, is a kind of a thriving intersection uh, of, um, of of translation of a different sort of problematic that is uh, um, of the revolution and its aftermath. Just one very specific thing. So what's the term for archaeology? Tabar Shenasi. Okay. No, archaeology is Boston Shenasi, maybe. Yeah, uh, yes. No, but... Genealogy is Tabar Shenasi. Yes, genealogy is tabloid. Genealogy is so, so, yeah, because uh, again, I know in, in Arabic there was a bit of a kind of an argument on this because it's, um, I think they, in Arabic they used hafariyat for the um, archaeology, which again is a bit strange, slightly strange kind of um, uh, term for it. So, archaeology of knowledge is hafariyat al ma'arifa, I think, in Arabic. Um, and, and that's mainly because of the perception of Foucault. Um, so if anyone ever to use that word, it's very clear that people are talking about Foucault. Um, and so I guess that's probably true of some of the other uses as well. Um, I think there might be another term that is not Boston Shanasi that's escaping me because Boston archaeology as a, as a field, as uh, a, yes, yeah. but as a method that we associate with, with Foucault and sort of historical epistemology, uh, I think Tabaj. The, oh, somebody suggested Diri Neshanasi. I'm not sure if that is. That, um, I need to go to some of the translations, but I think Tabar Shanasi is certainly for genealogy has been used, but I wonder whether it's sometimes also used for archaeology in the Foucaultian sense. Uh, I think uh, it, it is translated Diri Neshanasi Danish. Archaeology of knowledge. Yeah. Right. I see. Um, I, does it I think in, um, 
in some works, post is also used. So in Ibn Khaldun and social sciences, where uh, I think that is the term that, uh, for example, Taba Taba uses. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have still have loads of questions, but I'm not going to keep you too long, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> anyone else have any other questions? Mohsen, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, thanks. Can I, I wonder, um, just this is just in the spirit of conversation, and feel free. I wonder whether um, I, I now sense uh, the kind of a division or sort of different likings of analytic versus continental. Uh, a little more than I did in the, you know, when I, beginning of the conversations. And I wonder whether the analytic, um, in the after, in contemporary investment in analytic philosophy, um, sort of attachment to rigor, to precision, is, um, is, is really not really about the way rigor and precision is posed in analytic and continental philosophy, like I'd say in the West, but it's really actually pointing out the lack of institutional and discursive uh, spaces to develop continental philosophy. So the fact that there is the continental philosophy does not have a sort of a space uh, within the universities and within the institutions of education uh, and is kind of done by individual figures, individual translators, uh, who, who are quite capable, but they're not part of a, um, a sort of a debate. Uh, they're, not, they're not too many capable of translators. They're sort of individual stars as opposed to a tradition. Um, that comes to be criticized and as that comes to like be slightly, continental philosophy gets dismissed because of this, but not because of the nature of continental philosophy. I wonder whether that's part of the issue of continental philosophy in Iran. And I wonder what you uh, both think of this. I think Mohsen can comment on this better than yeah. I can because I'm not based in Iran, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe it is uh, because, because um, this, this um, leads to a less professional scholars working on continental philosophy. And in, 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 uh, despite the, I mean, uh, however, we will have, uh, we have uh, professional institutions uh, sticking to analytic philosophy and working hard in, in that uh, enterprise. And, and this really helps in shaping uh, rigor uh, rigorous uh, in tradition in analytic philosophy in Iran, but it, but I think this part of the problem, um, especially because because we have not uh, so much professional scholars uh, within some kind of institutions. We have that there are some uh, departments of philosophy which are uh, mostly, in a sense, continental, but um, but. Uh, this, this division between what has been done or what is going on in universities and what is going on in uh, outside the outside of the universities, this may may be some part of the problem. And and to be fair, we should be you know there there, there was quite a bit of contention after the revolution about who gets to be in these institutions. So this is a. Uh, not so much a weakness of individuals, but also an institutional historical limitation. Yeah, yeah, y yes. Uh, analytic philosophy is more disinterested, so to speak. Uh, so, so it is uh, less politically, uh, less, less less political than a uh, politically sensitive than than what is going on in continental philosophy. So yes, th that that is also part of the issue. But, but I also, I wonder, I mean, um, if you have all of these translations coming up and, and I kind of follow, basically I follow all this on Instagram because the publishers always put up what's coming out. And so it's really interesting to see what's coming out. Um, it seems that a hell of a lot of translations of continental philosophy are coming out, um, which, which suggests that there is a market, right? Um, I mean, I wonder, do translators, can they make a, a living 
translating these works. And if there is that kind of market and that readership, then in that sense, you can have a, um, an impact and open up a conversation without necessarily teaching at the university, which is arguably perhaps even as significant as philosophy departments. Because, you know, in many places, philosophy departments are not huge departments. I don't know how, how big philosophy departments are, what the intake of, of students is, but one assumes that there are, are, are more undergraduates joining, um, say, mathematics or engineering programs than there are joining um, BAs in philosophy. Um, so do you think that kind of, um, that market and that readership outside of universities is actually as significant maybe as the ones who are formerly in universities? Uh, absolutely. I think that I, I, I think that the conversations in universities is deeply inflicted by the conversations outside of the universities and, and the texts are brought to classes are debated. I think graduate students at various universities in um, Tehran uh, also attended these other institutes and they were they were, you know, be, they were learning. They were quite like they were they were involved and they they quite they were as much invested in their you, you know seminars at the universities as they were in attending to these alter you know institutions like Rokhda de Taze or Porsesh or other places and 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 engaging with those debates and um, um, I, so all of these arrangements I think make sense in relationship to one another. Uh, so even a, you know a religious reformer who might have a very different sensibility education come from a very different social milieu as um, somebody in these like let's say moral fact poor is reading that text or his student is reading that text we should so i think a very interesting um i uh, in 2014 i think i attended uh, a class on judith butler in porsche institute of social science the Porsche Institute, and then I was uh, in Rome in uh, one of the institutes that um, were thinking something like Islamic feminism. And as soon as they learned that I was at UC Berkeley and they knew that Judith Butler teaches at Berkeley, they asked me whether I could uh, facilitate a conversation. So these were the two spaces quite distinct from one another. So this was a uh, head of research at one of these institutions in Rome, a cleric who was also a PhD student at Adyan Bamazaheb, and thought that he was he him and his organization was as some kind of a forefront of Islamic feminism. And Judith Butler, I don't know to what extent he was familiar with Judith Butler's work, but Judith Butler is some kind of a stance for um, sort of forefront of let's say Western feminism from the point of view of this uh, gentleman. And so this, this conversation was to be um, kind of a conversations of different uh, historical religious horizons, uh, not unlike the ones that happened in Iran where uh, Habermas and Rorty came to Iran in the early 2000s. And these were quite passionate events. And of course, um, led to some political problems for those who facilitated them. And I needless to say i did not facilitate a conversation um between judith butler and others in home uh, but but you know, as you see the, the the i am sure the teaching of butler in these alternative spaces has an effect on uh you know the conversation about feminism in alternative spaces or texts of butler that have been translated to persian but they are circulate online because they wouldn't be able to get um, passed through uh, the the Ministry of Islamic Culture and Guidance, but they were they're available for 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 various whoever wants to read them and think about gender and sexuality. Um, so, but I do think is still the first question that Mohsen asked me that the fact of not having an institutional center does very much affect the possibility of debate of these about you know debating continental philosophy as opposed to simply um reacting to it simply consuming it simply be subject to the rules of the market you know yeah and and i think part of it is uh, i mean I, if i reflect on on one of my first like major experiences which was the 
1999 uh, Mullah Sadr Congress in, in Tehran. And well, it was like, it was an amazing um, trip because we were grad students, so we were just having a laugh. Um, and you've got all these huge names in analytic philosophy who were there. You didn't have any major names in continental philosophy. And that was simply because of the people who were organizing it. So, you know, you had people like Hamid Rahid, you had people like Ahmed Ahmadi, you had people like Ziyad Mawahid. I mean, they were basically inviting their friends, right? And, and they were the ones who basically were running, um, I guess, philosophy in, in the sort of the, the major centers in Iran. Um, and so it ended up being this rather strange dialogue between analytic philosophers and uh, a bunch of uh, Ma'amameen who, who knew their Kant and Hegel to a certain extent, uh, and the rest of us kind of just going off and going shopping and stuff. Uh, but um, uh, th thank you for that. I, I, was, um, I have many more questions, but I, I don't really want to keep you. I might ask you one very quick question, which is about Agamben, because we talked a bit about Schmidt. Is Agamben also quite popular in Iran? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And a lot of his works have been translated. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's Murad Farhad Pur and the translation circle around uh, Murad ha have, been, have been translating Agamben. And, uh, and I, I, uh, yes, that's the, I think there is, uh, there is a lot. Of course, Foucault, I think uh, Foucault has also been widely translated. And in a field that is dominated, let's say, by, by men, by translators and thinkers that are mostly men who are then translated by men, uh, one of the few thinkers that was um, one of the few, trans few translators in this scene, Niku Sarhosh, uh, is one of the translators of, uh, of Foucault. And Barane Madian is also a translator. These two are sort of stand out, I think. I'm sure there are other folks, uh, but Warren A. Madian was teaching on Butler at uh, Porsche that, um, that I was speaking about earlier. Cool. So um, I think we will um, kind of let you go at this point. I'm going to stop uh, recording. Thank you, Milad. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for